Okay, I think uh, we, we can get started. So Tatiana is a postdoctoral researcher in the machine learning and optimization lab at EPFL. She got her PhD from EPFL, but during her PhD studies, she also did internships at Mila and DeepMind. The Swiss National Science Foundation recently awarded her a postdoctoral fellowship and in 2021 will join Professor Michael Jordan's lab. Her main interests lie at the intersection of game theory and machine learning, and she strives to understand the training dynamics of multiplayer differentiable games. Today, she will be talking about one of the hottest topics in ML in recent years, so generative adversarial networks. Uh, hi, Please, uh, it's all yours. Thanks for the introduction. So, um, yeah. Um, so today I'll uh, directly dive in, in the interest of time. Um, so it, it was hard to prepare the slides because uh, there are a lot of um, interesting works on these topics and uh, sorry if I'm um, like omitting some of them. So in this talk, I'm trying, uh, I'll try to give a general introduction to GANs, first of all. Um, I'd like to emphasize why, how GANs differ from other existing generative models and describe the architecture. So it's really going to be uh, the major focus is going to be an introduction to Um And although it's a bit like ambitious to, to present this in one hour, I also try to hint why I like our, uh, working in the min-max optimization and why I think it's important and interesting. Uh, so if you don't fully understand this part, it's probably because uh, there's, I didn't explain it enough, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but please bear with me just to, I get him. So uh, here I am quoting uh, Richard Feynman, uh, what I cannot preach, I do not understand. Uh, hopefully to, to uh, like motivate you to think uh, about why generative models are important in uh, machine learning and deep learning in general. So uh, I saw that you already had some talks on generative models, so I'm going to be very, very brief here. Uh, I'm just going to emphasize that uh, when we have a classification, or I'm going to call it classical uh, single objective minimization, our goal is to learn a posterior distribution of P of Y, the label given um, a data sample. And in uh, gender models, we are trying to uh, we are trying to learn the probability over the data point, which is P of X. But it can also be a conditional generative probability, so we might want to uh, uh, like uh, let's say a uh, given a sample or given a class we want to generate a sample so this all fall into the category of uh, generative models and um, we want to fit our learning a distribution uh, that uh, we can uh, at inference time uh, take samples of it and so um, um, so uh, depending on the type of the of the generative model we can either estimate the probability of one point we can get a value for it or we can uh, have a way to quickly sample from it. I'm going to describe that on the next slide. But first, I wanted to um, uh, to just mention that uh, right now we have a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, data that is stored um, in uh, uh, like in our phones and laptops and everywhere. So it's um, uh, the data is notably of high dimensional space. So the only way for us to 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 uh, let's say, uh, come up with algorithms that can do something intelligent is if, if, the, if we work in a latent space, which is a lower dimensional space than the original one. And this is an underlying goal of generative models. And um, so therefore you can come up with um, a lot of application and almost everywhere you can, you can apply a generative model, learn the latent distribution. So I saw that you already had a talk on version uh, out encoders, which used, um, unlabeled data. So basically you can you can always give them a data set, uh, try to learn a latent space and apply your you do your application in that latent space. And therefore they're very important. So another maybe more direct uh, application is the planning and enforcement learning. So where agents can uh, generate uh, ex like a simulation of the future and then uh, they can decide based on evaluation the, evaluating the state that they might end up. Um, and one interesting application that I, I mentioned, I'm showing here on the uh, right uh, corner is um, so uh, is also physics for those of you who are more familiar with physics. So we can assume that there is a um, Hamiltonian system that uh, is uh, that is generating the the process which conserves some quantity of energy. 
And so we might want to generate samples um, that, uh, that are produced by this, uh, by this system. Um, and I probably skipped a lot of interesting applications, but um, in, the, in the end of the slides, you also have extra additional appendix where you can, where you can find more, more applications. So, uh, so um, just to summarize, we have uh, explicit density uh, models um, and implicit density models. So this is where we get um, a value for, for our sample. And uh, the implicit density, uh, we can sample according to um, uh, like a distribution that we, we learn. So, and GANs fall into this category here because they don't uh, provide a value for the uh, for the, the probability over the data points, but we have a fast and computationally cheap way to sample from it. From it. Um, and so uh, before uh, describing GANs, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to describe two objective optimization. So uh, in um, minimization, you can, uh, we have a predefined loss function. And for this loss function, we normally take um, humans to, to annotate a sample and we pre predefine it. And, and then we are trying to, we have, we have to have a model which is parameterized with some parameters theta and we're trying to minimize the loss. So maybe a simpler case is if we uh, we take, let's say one parameter theta and we have a predefined loss function and uh, that we want to minimize. And maybe the simplest case that we can think of is if we take a convex function and uh, at initialization, we are, um, we are initialized randomly on this axis and we take the gradient of this uh, loss function at the point and then we move according to it. So at the end, in the ideal ca case, we end up in a point where the loss is minimized. So this is, uh, uh, this is what, what the whole pr optimization procedure actually ends up doing. Um, and of course, this is a simplified version. It can be, the function can be highly done convex, there can be subtle points and etc. And just to contrast it, contrast it to, to objective minimization, um, in the, Maybe the simplest case that we can think of in the objective minimization is if we have a convex concave game. And so if we, we have a loss function that I might sometimes call it value function as well, which depends on theta and phi, and we are minimizing with respect to theta and maximize with respect to the right player here. And so um, if we fix a phi, um, we obtain, uh, we obtain a, a function that, uh, that is a convex. So it looks like this. And in that case, the player is trying to, to find the minimum value. And we fix theta, we see that, uh, uh, that the, op, the max player is trying, uh, has a concave function and is trying to find the max value. So in this case, contrary to the previous one that I showed, ideally we end up on a saddle point. And at the center of the saddle point, um, uh, where it's also called Nash equilibrium, um, and, um, and this just means that uh, uh, no player wants to change his position once we are at, um, at the Nash equilibrium. So if we fix one player, the, the other player won't want to move away from that point. And um, so uh, in the previous slide, I showed um, a simplification of a general two player game. Uh, so I took that uh, the loss function uh, for one player is minus the loss of the other one. And this is also called the zero sum game. And in general, we can have any loss function and the, this loss function needs to depend on both the set of parameters. So this is the formulation for the two player min max uh, game. And at the end, we are trying to find a point theta star and phi star that are going to satisfy this equation here, either locally or globally. Uh, so this just uh, means that um, theta star, um, so the solution that we want to converge to, let's call it theta star and phi star, is a global minimizer and phi star is a global maximizer. Okay, the signs are correct, okay. So um, yeah, so the, I'm also giving here for completeness the, the definition of differentiable Nash equilibrium, but it's not necessary for the rest of the talk. So finally, let's jump into what are generative adversarial networks. So they were proposed by Ian Goodfellow and his collaborators in 2014. And the idea is that we have 
uh, at the end we want to produce a, a model that is uh, called the generator. Um, and to do that, we use an additional extra model, which is called the discriminator. And the discriminator is um, is a mapping from the real uh, data space. Let's call it uh, that every x um, is uh, in R D x, and um, in some dimension, it can be, for example, uh, let's say for m is this 28 by 28. Um, and um, at training time, we are training the discriminator so as to distinguish whether a sample is real or fake. And for this, um, and we don't need a labels from humans, but because we know from which sample or from which, um, let's say, set we take the, the sample, we can assign a label to it. And in the rest of the slides, I'm going to assume that I'm assigning one for the real sample and uh, zero for the fake one. And so the discriminator is um, is a standard classifier that is trying to distinguish uh, from which set the um, sample originates from. And the generator is. Um, uh, is a mapping from uh, lower dimensional space. So let's call that uh, Z is in R D Z. And typically DZ is way smaller than a DX. And so uh, and so um, we have some dimension, let's say 100, and we take a sample, uh, let's say we take the noise data distribution. So I'm going to often call this a latent vector noise. And so it can be sampled from let's say a Gaussian distribution. And uh, the generator is a mapping from this noise to the real, uh, to the space of the real data point. And when we train the generator, uh, it aims at fooling the discriminator that the samples are real. So it means that when I'm writing down the loss, I'm going to flip the label when I take samples from it. And I'm going to take the gradients of that loss uh, to update the generator. So as you can see that uh, unlike um, classical uh, single objective, we get gradients here uh, to, as a signal to update the, the generator. So maybe to summarize here the, um, uh, the notation, uh, please uh, like interrupt me if you have some questions. So um, uh, the, so with PZ, I'm going to denote the, the known uh, data distribution, the, sorry, the, some known simple distribution. For example, it can be a Gaussian. Um, and with PD, I'm going to denote the real data distribution, and PG is going to stand for the generator, which is going to be the distribution of the fake sample. So if I take all the uh, Z points that I'm generating, uh, what is the, the distribution that my generator is giving? Um, so one way to formalize uh, GANs is we, if we use um, this expression here. So I'm going to be uh, I'm going to come back several times to this expression. Uh, so you might. Um, already recognize that this is um, a standard uh, binary cross entropy. Uh, I think you, you probably have already mentioned it. So um, so normally in binary pro cross entropy, we will take one over n sum of this, and which is the equivalent for the expectation. The label here is one, here the label is a zero. And so this is the, the equation for uh, binary cross entropy. And the discriminator is trying to maximize this expression here. So you can see that this is going to be maximized if, if whenever we take a sample from the real data distribution, d outputs one, and whenever we take a sample from the fake data distribution, d outputs zero. So this is when the, this expression is going to be maximized. And on the other hand, g is trying to minimize this expression. We see that in the first term, it doesn't, um, it doesn't appear. So we can ignore this in the loss function. And we see that uh, this expression is going to be minimized uh, when D is outputting one for, for, the, uh, for the sample taken from the generator. And so th this is nice. We have um, loss functions that we can train our two models with. And here I'm just giving a quick note because in practice people tend to, uh, people use the so-called non-saturating again. And if you try to implement again, you're probably, um, you know, this one is going to show up. So at the beginning of the training, you, you, uh, the, um, the, the generator is initialized randomly. And so the discriminator is not going to have a hard time distinguishing which sample is hard and which sample is real. And therefore, um, it's going to probably output uh, uh, like zero. And we, here, the x-axis is the output of the discriminator. And we see that if we stick with the original like uh, loss that was given in the previous uh, formula, we might have zero, zero gradients in the beginning. So just from a practical perspective, people uh, replaced this um, 
uh, this uh, equation here with something that is not analytically equivalent, but is intuitively it's the same uh, because uh, because um, we are instead of trying to find the mean over this expression, we're going to find the mass of this expression here. And we see that when we when we plot this function, we see that uh, we have a much larger gradient at the beginning of the training. Um, and this is important because we want to have signal to train our generator with. Okay, so um, this is nice, but you at this point, uh, you you probably got the idea because it's quite simple, but you might wonder if um, this makes sense at all. Like, how do we know that uh, the training procedure is going to bring us in a point that we want to converge to? And so um, the uh, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to uh, try to show that um, at the equilibrium, the, uh, the distribution of the fake sample is equivalent to the to the uh, the one of the uh, the real data samples, and so in this I'm going to do a big assumption. So I'm going to uh, think that I have infinite model capacity. I'm just going to optimize this uh, distribution directly, and um, and I'm going to ignore the fact that at the end I need to parameterize these net networks. So. Um, to see what happens at equilibrium, we're just going to take, it's very simple, we're going to take the derivative with respect to the, um, of this expression here, uh, and we're going to um, uh, find the optimal uh, uh, discriminator, and then we're going to see uh, every place that, that expression to see uh, what is the optimal generator. So uh, if we replace here the uh, expectations with, um, uh, with an integral over, uh, over uh, those data points, we in the previous uh, slide we had uh, sorry we had expectation over uh, pz and we had expectation over pd so here I'm just replacing those um, and in the to obtain the second line uh, we are just going to use the fact uh, that um, uh, whenever we whenever we are integrating over all the possible uh, z we are going to obtain a vector x which is, um, because we're integrating over all the z, is going to follow a distribution pg. So I'm, I'm replacing here uh, g of z with uh, x. And at the same time, um, uh, I'm, uh, instead of using pd here, I'm using pg because this is the distribution that I'm, uh, that I'm obtaining. And so now if we look at the, this expression, uh, the second expression that we got here, um, we see that this is going to be uh, uh, some constant. Um, uh, we, we can look at it as a constant multiplying log of d of x, another constant multiplying log of one minus d of x, which is which is given here. Uh, and now we we want to look at the, this uh, function here. Uh, and uh, to to see uh, uh, to analyze the extreme points, we are going to take the first uh, derivative. It is equalized to zero, and we obtain that uh, this is uh, one of the extreme points. And now we're going to do one more test, which is the second uh, derivative, to see whether it's a maximum or minimum. And then we obtain that this point is indeed a maximum. So the optimal, we, we replace back A and B, and we obtain that the optimal discriminator is uh, when PD uh, equal, when uh, it's equal to PD over PD of X plus PG of, um, uh, of X. So now we're going to replace this expression into, uh, into the one from the previous slide. Uh, and we are going to obtain that, uh, which, which, which is here. Uh, and we're going to obtain that uh, we have some expectation of log of um, uh, this, uh, this value that we replace for the optimal discriminator. Um, and um, now I, uh, we are going to use, um, you're going, we're just going to like easily manipulate this uh, expectation. So we're going to, I think, divide by two and take it out of the expectation because we know that uh, the jensen shannon uh, divergence is equivalent to this, uh, uh, this expression here. Uh, we are just going to try to divide uh, here by two. So therefore, we're going to take out uh, some uh, divide, multiply and divide and take out out of the expectation. And we obtain that uh, at the, uh, we obtain this expression here. Uh, so we know that the jensen shannon divergence. Um, so I'm in, the, in this talk, I'm going to assume that uh, you're familiar with this. But in the end of the slides, in the happenings, you're going to find the exact expressions for, uh, uh, for, for this divergence. And we know that this one is minimized only when the two distributions are um, 
are equivalent. So uh, if we want to minimize this expression, uh, we see that um, this can happen only when the two distributions are identical. And interestingly, if we go back in this expression here, we, we see that at the equilibrium, when we take sample either from the fake or the real data distribution, the discriminator is going to be completely uh, like food. Like it will always, uh, it will output 0.5 probability, which means I don't know whether it's a fake or real. Okay, so this was a nice sanity check, but um, as I said, I assumed uh, that uh, uh, the, the parameters, uh, the models are um, uh, like we're optimizing in this, uh, what people tend to call function space. So we ignore the fact that we, we have to, uh, at the end, parameters our models and I do the optimization in the parameter space, which is what I described at the beginning of this talk. And so, um, I'm, in this slide, I'm going to um, emphasize that uh, we we have parameterized models for G, which I'm going to call theta, and for this this parameter, I'm going to call them phi. And in this slide, I'm showing the most commonly used version to update uh, GANs, but it's not the only one. Um, so I'm uh, the way this is most commonly done in practice is that. Um, Every, every time we first up, we take a sample from, so this should be uh, a uniform distribution of the, of the data set. So we take a sample from, from the data set. We, uh, we take a sample from the predefined uh, noise distribution. Um, and then we first update the discriminator. Then we take a new sample from, uh, from the noise uh, data distribution, and then we update the generator. Um, so, uh, why I call this alternating is because we first update the discriminator and then we take this updated version here when we, when we update the, the generator. So we can write a simultaneous version of this algorithm when we store a copy here uh, of, uh, let's call it, um, sorry, so let's call it uh, phi um, uh, hat or uh, and which is just going to be a copy of phi, and then instead we can use the phi hat. So, so what I mean that um, we won't use the updated version to 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 update it. And here I'm assuming that I'm using a gradient descent. So eta is my step size or learning rate. Um, and um, uh, uh, yeah, so and in practice this is normally done with at least Adam or other. Uh, more sophisticated algorithms that are that are designed for minmax, uh, but in this um, in this algorithm, I'm just writing uh, the the simplest form. So just a quick demo. Uh, in uh, here, I'm um, I have a real data that lies in 2D, and uh, it lies on this um, what is called the Swiss roll data set, um, and I'm showing it in uh, in orange or yellow, uh, um, how you see it. And um, uh, the fake samples are shown in uh, green. And at the beginning of the training, they're all initialized. Uh, they're all uh, sample, uh, pointed here. So when we sample from the generator, there are just uh, samples that are here. The, the lines that you see are the level curves of the discriminator. And we know that the discriminator is outputting value between 0 and 1. So the, the lower, the darker the level curve. And we see that the discriminator at the beginning thinks that the fake uh, samples are here and he thinks there is this real data. And after a couple of iterations, uh, we see that um, the, the generator manages uh, to, to learn the, the real data distribution. And this is uh, using this vanilla alternating uh, GAN framework. Okay, so I'm, um, uh, the next couple of slides are going to like uh, quickly uh, describe some variations of GAN framework. And I'm just going to mention, instead of um, architecture, I'm just going to mention one, which is going to be the DCGAN architecture, uh, which I believe you're going to encounter if you if you work with GANs. And, um, uh, and I'm also going to give like uh, very few applications, but uh, in the appendix, you can find references to more. Uh, so uh, first, I, I wanted to point out one um, uh, particular um, uh, issue that we might encounter. So in the beginning, GANs were quite unstable to train. Uh, and Arosky proposed, uh, pointed out that um, uh, the fact that we take Jensen, Shannon, Divergent, 
might not be the best idea because if we, for simplicity, take the um, uh, like we have only one parameter to optimize, and we have let's say zero distributions or uniform, uh, it, it doesn't matter. The, the point is that uh, we uh, we have two uh, different uh, uh, distributions, and the, these two distributions have different supports. And therefore, uh, then we we, we um, compute the kulbeck library divergence, which we're going to obtain uh, in the Jensen channel. We're going to obtain plus infinity for the logarithm of the kulbeck library, and we're going to obtain log two for the Jensen channel divergence. And if we take the derivative, we won't get meaningful uh, a signal how to train our generator. And so one attractive uh, solution to this is the so-called Wasserstein distance. And um, so the Wasserstein distance is also known as the earth mover uh, distance. And, um, uh, and it is defined uh, as follows. So we can, we can take uh, two probability distributions. Uh, and let's say one is uh, wider and the other one is uh, higher. So uh, we 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 are going to think of it as um, uh, as, as uh, discretizing, not discretizing, but uh, like uh, like a pile of dirt, and we want to find a map such that we can we can move this one to obtain the other one. So in this case, I might want to instead of being the wider, I might want to move this uh, this ones uh, at the tails at the top so that I obtain the second one, and. Um, this is a very uh, like uh, intuitive explanation, uh, like explanation of the Wasserstein distance. And every time I I move uh, like uh, one pile uh, of this distribution, I'm also paying a price. And um, I, the Wasserstein distance assume that this cost is predefined. And uh, in this uh, equation here, I'm taking that uh, this is the Euclidean distance of how much I need to move. Uh, my um, what is the distance that I need to move my file? And what, for example, here in this, um, we can see one cost function uh, that we can use where if I move from i to i, the cost is zero and therefore uh, the diagonal is uh, like low as possible. And the more I need to shift, the higher price I pay. And so the Wasserstein distance is defined as uh, the mean, the uh, like, um, finding a map of all the possible maps that I can think of uh, so that this cost, when I'm multiplying the map with the cost, I get um, a lowest possible value. So it's the infinitum over uh, all uh, the possible joint probability distributions between the two given distributions. So, um, so if we come back to the previous uh, example, uh, Arofsky show, uh, showed that um, uh, we uh, in in the previous example we will obtain uh, more meaningful gradients if we use the Wasserstein distance. However, one drawback that you might already realize is that this obtaining this uh, this here uh, can be formulated like with linear programming, but it uh, it's uh, very it goes um, exponentially um, intractable because um, when you have discrete random variables, so even for discrete ones, um, when the when the dimension of the input variables increases, it, it, even for discrete ones, it becomes intractable. And luckily, there exists um, the cantorovich rubinstein duality, which just uh, reformulates this problem here as instead of infinite as a supremum. Uh, and we have this uh, expression here. So I'm not going to uh, derive it, but at the end of the slides, you'll find like very like informal proof sketch that I hope it, it will it will convince you why these two are um, uh, the connection between the two. And here, uh, the only constraint that we need to um, impose is that the function is uh, is uh, Lipschitz one, and um, uh, the function being Lipschitz one just tells us um, uh, how that there is a constraint on the growth of the function. And this, uh, uh, it's uh, it's quite intuitive because, uh, as I mentioned, we're using uh, the gradient of the discriminator to update the, the, the generator. So you might uh, think that if these gradients are unbounded, you're going to have hard time optimizing these two networks. 
and I really like this uh, this work because it um, uh, like rigorously tried to show that we would like to to impose some constraints on the discriminator, and uh, this is what was done in the W GAN paper. The research then gone, and if you start working with guess, you'll probably encounter it. Where it was uh, just the Jensen and Shannon divergence was replaced with the Wasserstein. And here, the, the function that is the uh, uh, Lipschitz uh, is, in fact, the function that is represented by the discriminator. And so uh, during training, we are, um, we are optimizing this function here. Um, and we also we need to impose a constraint that the discriminator is uh, one Lipschitz uh, function. And uh, how to do this properly for non-convex function, I would say it's still an open question. Um, but uh, so what we would like to do is to take all the possible values and enforce a gradient penalty that the gradient needs to satisfy the, the Lipschitz uh, constraint. Uh, however, this is intractable, and there are some, uh, there are a lot of, there are at least here are some work that propose a way to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to skip them due to time constraints, but uh, feel, please feel free to ask questions uh, regarding them. So uh, in the beginning of this presentation, I also mentioned that uh, we can also uh, like um, generate the, the conditional probability distribution p of x p one y. So I'm, I might want to say, okay, I want more samples, only like more cats. I don't want to other dogs and stuff like that. So and I can condition on some additional information and I can obtain generative uh, model for that conditional probability distribution. So uh, in that case, we have some additional information that we are passing both to the generator and to the discriminator during training and during testing, during inference. So um, here I'm mentioning the this again architecture. So on the right side, you will see a standard uh, CNN uh, where we are uh, uh, where we use convolutional layers. And in GANs, we have the opposite problem. Instead of downscaling, we have uh, like going from smaller dimensional space to higher dimensional space. And in this paper, uh, the authors uh, proposed the, the wrongfully called the deconvolutional layers which the simplest way to explain them is uh, that the forward pass is like the backward pass of a convolutional layer. So they are just a swap. Um, so I'm going to finish this uh, section with, um, with some examples. So here I'm showing examples from the big gun um, uh, paper where authors uh, scaled uh, uh, like against to higher resolution and um, we can see on the right a snake that probably a human wouldn't generate because you had some prior knowledge that snakes won't be able to go that far with uh, this, um, this, <laughs> this body. But anyway, it's, it's interesting, like uh, GANs don't get so much prior information as we know. And we see that it still generalizes uh, beyond, uh, beyond the sample that we were given because we, we know that this sample wasn't in the training distribution. Uh, another uh, application that I'm going to show here is um, is uh, using conditional GANs. So uh, here we have a data set, which is the middle column in these two. Um, in this, so we have some data set. And uh, we can use some techniques, existing deterministic techniques, that, to get the edges out of it. And so we can obtain like huge data set to train conditional again. And a question is, uh, my, and uh, why would this be useful? Well, we might want to enlarge a data set maybe for one class or so something like that. So, and for one particular sketch, because we sample that as well, we can obtain a lot different, uh, a lot more many samples for one, one input. And so uh, a question that you might be wondering is whether it generalizes beyond uh, the data distribution. And here in this paper, uh, the authors took um, like human drawn sketches that were not produced from images. And they saw that uh, it still generalizes, which was nice results. Okay, so I have a quick te test for you. So which one, uh, which one of these samples you think is real? Um, so if you if you zoom zoom in, you might wonder that you might guess that this one might be the fake sample. But nonetheless, um, we have to admit that this. Uh, <laughs> okay, we have some answers which are saying none. <laughs> Uh, none, none, like we have to admit that uh, really um, 
uh, guns are generating uh, impressively good uh, good um, samples. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, uh, like uh, uh, quickly hint on why min max optimization is interesting and at least give my own perspective. Um, and um, uh, it might be too rushed, but uh, I hope uh, it gives some insight why I find it interesting. So um, let us consider uh, the, the exactly the game that I showed in the in the beginning of the slide. So we have a convex concave game, which is nothing just a dot product between theta and phi. And so um, uh, let us call this this f of theta and phi. And um, so update theta and phi. We want to take the derivative of f with respect to theta with respect to phi. Sorry about my handwriting. So uh, in this case, we are going to obtain that this is uh, phi. In this case, we're going to obtain that this is theta because this is just a dot product. And so now we use gradient descent. Um, theta t plus one is going to be theta t uh, because we are minimizing is going to be minus eta uh, times, um, times phi and phi t plus one is going to be phi t plus because we are maximizing the step size or the learning rate times theta. And now if we if we define uh, w t uh, as uh, the two variables concatenated together, uh, so we're going to have theta phi. Um, we can rewrite uh, this uh, this one. So I'm going to uh, continue from here. So um, as um, uh, as a as a matrix that multiplies uh, this theta and phi, uh, and we will see why in, in the next step. So um, okay, so I'll have that. Sorry, I have the W T plus one is equals to. I'm going to take plus, and here I have this here. So I have a minus. And now um, I want to take theta t and phi t uh, out of the brackets, and I, I will have something like identity plus the learning rate. Uh, and this is, okay, so uh, this is going to be. Um, uh, zero and uh, minus one, and this is going to be one and zero. And so here, if I write down this matrix, I'm going to obtain one minus eta and uh, one, sorry, eta and one. And so if I take the norm of uh, this expression here, I will take I will obtain that. Uh, uh, the norm of every next update is going to be one plus uh, eta squared times the, the current one. And what I know about this game is that the solution is at zero, zero. So sorry about my bad drawing, but um, I know that the solution is at zero, zero. And if I'm at point, let's say omega t, uh, I know that uh, each update is going to, in fact, bring me uh, like further away based on this uh, this analysis. And this is interesting observation because um, uh, in, in standard uh, minimization, this doesn't happen. Um, so you might wonder what uh, what is the difference. Uh, so in minimization, we would normally take uh, the Hessian, the second derivative to see, to analyze the dynamics. And the Hessian is always going to be, which is the second derivative of the of the function and this, uh, because we have only one function it's always going to be symmetric and here uh, in games we can say that v is a concatenated vector with respect to the two sets of parameters and uh, v prime is going to be the jacobian of the joint vector field and i'm calling it the vector field because this doesn't have to be um, a gradient field because it's not the same function and so we see that um, uh, these values don't uh, want, uh, don't have to be the same, and therefore uh, we can uh, when we take the eigenvalues of this uh, um, 
uh, Jacobian of the joint vector field, uh, we might get uh, negative, uh, like um, imaginary parts in the eigenvalues, and therefore, in those cases, we know that the dynamics exhibits rotations. And why, uh, like, why, why do we even care about this? Uh, so uh, one reason is the example that I just showed. Um, in that example, uh, there exists a, a, a big rotational component in the vector field. So we will always rotate around the equilibria depending on whether we, we initialize, uh, where we initialize. Um, and another reason why we should uh, care about, uh, so on the left, I'm showing us uh, like a minimization problem. And in this kind of problems, uh, the vector field is always pointing to the solution that we want to converge to, which here is shown in the in the blue star. So when we assume when we have a uh, full batch training, which is uh, the gradient when we computed at, uh, as a sum of the loss of the entire data set, um, uh, we have the direction that directly points to uh, points to the solution. And we assume bounded variance, which happens due to the fact that we take subsample of the full data set. Uh, we still see that every step is going to bring us closer to the solution. In none of the cases, we don't go, uh, we don't diverge away. Uh, and whereas in games, due to the fact that we have these rotational components, we see that um, when we take the, the, the batch gradient would be the tangent on this uh, circle. And now if we assume bounded variance, we see that uh, with higher probability, we are going to, we are going to, so because this is larger, we, with higher probability, we're going to diverge away. And although this is extremely simple uh, bilinear gain and minimization, we already see that some insights from these games do follow in practice because um, people tried using larger mini batches for minimization and it was shown that it doesn't help the convergence. Um, and whereas in games, it was shown, for example, in the big, big gun paper, it was shown that it is necessary for it not to diverge. Uh, so not, not only that it helps, but it was necessary to use uh, a sufficiently large uh, bed size. So, um, okay, and uh, to come back to the problem that I just pointed out, I'm here, I'm showing one, uh, uh, like um, a method to train gas. This was specifically inspired by the problem that I just described which is called extra gradient. So uh, the story about extra gradient is that instead of me playing against my opponent, I will assume what my opponent would do and I will plan, play against that. So what does this mean? Um, it means that we have, uh, we're going to compute this T plus one half point on the, using standard uh, gradient descent that so far we were using. And instead of taking, uh, and but uh, instead of uh, like using this one, I'm also going to store my copy at time uh, at time step t, and so then when I'm actually updating my update, I'm going to take the gradient and this uh, future point. And why would this help? So if we uh, if we assume again some rotational um, like a vector field, we see we are here at time. Uh, sorry, we are here at time w t. And the gradient is going to bring us here, and we take some small step, learning step here. Um, and now uh, we take uh, uh, the gradient at this future point. I'm going to call it WT plus one half, and we apply it here. Okay, so I'm just taking the same direction here. And now the actual update is going to be here. So if this is my solution, I, I see that um, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, converge um, to the solution in this uh, bilinear game. So this is only one of the numerous methods that were designed uh, because of this uh, rotational um, uh, vector field. Um, uh, and uh, why, why do I think, think it's interesting to focus on this? So if we look into uh, uh, what is the underlying uh, like uh, core method that people use in uh, what is called AI um, is um, is actually gradient descent, and uh, we still have a lot of um, uh, optimization issues that we don't understand from the aspect of minmax, and uh, and what if we do understand it, it might be the reason for uh, uh, to make to make a new big changes because. 
we can think of a lot of problems which we can reformulate them as multiplayer games or in reinforcement learning using different objectives. And if we do understand this properly, um, it might uh, allow us to, to, to solve new problems. So I did not present in this talk my own work, but I listed them here in case uh, some of you want to, to write. So please do write me uh, if you have some questions. Uh, so one of um, uh, one of these works is the extra gradient method that I just described, combined with various reduced uh, gradient methods, so that we we deal with this uh, with this noise using techniques that are non non except imitation. Um, and some other questions that I, that I'm going to mention here just to 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 motivate um, are that we do have some negative theoretical rigorous results that are showing that. Um, that for high for non-convex game arriving at an approximate Nash equilibrium might be computationally intractable. Uh, we have some uh, theoretical rigorous results from the, using tools from dynamic systems, which show that um, in in the uh, that we might end up in what are called limit cycles, uh, which are cycles that uh, consist of points which are we are going to revisit with probability one. So in that, that's bad because we know that uh, we won't converge to one point. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention that uh, in this talk, I use Nash equilibria throughout the presentation, but there is also a recent line of work that uh, is questioning this notion of optimality just by the fact that we tend to optimize things uh, sequentially in an alternating way. Uh, and these are called cycle break uh, equilibria, and they're a superset of Nash equilibria. So I, for those of you who are interested, I, I did some uh, some uh, references here. Um, okay, so maybe to summarize, in this talk we um, discussed uh, why GANs are uh, different. Um, they don't provide uh, probability for the data point, but we can quickly sample from it. Uh, we discussed in detail the framework um, and also that the loss can be replaced and uh, the original GAN population can be modified using different uh, distances. Um, we discussed uh, uh, WGAN, conditional GAN, uh, and, um, and others. And um, we also motivated why mean max optimization uh, is different, uh, hopefully. And um, uh, yeah, and why is it interesting? So thank you all for your. Um, Attention, I prepared like the Swiss wall experiment that I showed. You can find in this call of uh, here. Uh, you can also find that this again example on MNIST. And um, yeah, thank you all for your, your attention. <laughs>